started. So yeah, let's do it. Let's kick it off. Mm -hmm. um, hello, and welcome to What's Your Problem Side, where we will be examining problem slides, obviously, what they are, how to make them a little more strategic, and of course, well-designed. So I'm Molly Gagan. I am the content and community manager here for Presentation Thinking. And that is one half of the Presentation Thinking podcast with my co-host, Mikey Maduski, the founder of Ghost Ranch Communications. And it's where we talk about presentations, think about presentation, what's, what separates the good from the great. We obsess over storytelling, who's doing it the best. You get it. You can tune in on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere you stream your podcasts. Um, wanted to give you a little background on what presentation thinking is, aside from having a cool name and one of the most provocative depictions of Shakespeare here that anyone's ever seen. <laughs> presentation thinking is a place where professionals can go down the storytelling rabbit hole in the hopes of uncovering lessons to level up on one of the world's most sought after soft skills, which is the ability to sell an idea. So the team of visual storytellers at Ghost Ranch has been deep in the weeds of designing, developing presentations for eight years now almost for the world's brightest business leaders uh, every day. And it's really led us to realize that great presentations just don't come out of thin air. They take a ton of work and they don't just look pretty, they actually say something. So when the Ghost Ranch team realized how we would benefit from holistically studying this approach to presentation mastery, we decided to kind of share these findings along the way. And that is truly what presentation thinking is. Great presentations balance art, science, strategy, and delivery, these four pillars you see here, and the craft of presentation design itself pulls from so many disciplines. So you can find inspiration from well beyond the slide, and we just don't, we don't just mean Pinterest, you know. Um, presentation thinking is truly on a mission to pull information from the world around us to bring you fresh content and lessons uh, that will, you know, help expand your view and um, level up your presentations. So this has ultimately brought us to where we are today, uh, the Storyteller Study Club, this Lunch and Learn being one of the series. And this is truly just an opportunity for us to put into practice what we preach, like what we've learned and share knowledge. Um, so please feel free, please, to throw questions in the chat and or the Q&A box on the Zoom window as we go along. And we'll definitely have a solid amount of time at the end here to, um, to get through as many as possible. And yes, you will be getting a recording of this uh, presentation as well. And we are so passionate about problems slides that we might just be doing this one again. So um, tell your team if you find it useful, we can absolutely um, make it happen again. So as you know, we're talking about problem slides and your fearless guide here taking you through the windy road to the dark forest is Jeff Carter, one of Ghost Ranch's amazing creative directors. He is employee number one at the ranch, which is a fun fact, and he's been around for almost the entirety of the eight years that Ghost Ranch has been in, in existence. So Jeff has really seen such a breadth of uh, decks and variation of work. So he knows what a good problem side looks like. And he also knows that it helps to better convey your story, which if you haven't caught on, storytelling is what we're all about. So without further ado, take it away, Jeff. I'll let you lead from here. Thanks, Molly. Uh, I'm really excited to be presenting today. This is something I'm super passionate about. And like Molly said, uh, I'm a creative director here at Ghost Ranch. I was employee number one. So I have seen just a ton of slides in my day. Um, I'm a Colorado native whose family raises bison. I think we might have a webinar on that later, I'm sure. Get a lot of questions about bison. Um, but much to the chagrin of anyone that I talk to, I'm a huge enthusiast of all things PowerPoint and presentation design related. I think my family and friends are just absolutely sick of hearing about it by this point. Um, but if you would have told me back in 2016 that seven years later, I'd be hosting a webinar about PowerPoint slides, I would have laughed at you and then I would have made this whole webinar in InDesign. But, you know, a lot has changed over those last seven years since this photo was taken on my first day uh, at Ghost Ranch on the patio of the El Federal restaurant in Denver, working with this guy, Mikey, that I had just met. Uh, it was a wild ride. But the biggest thing that has changed in those seven years is that I've become a father to two beautiful girls. Um, and like so many kids, I am sure my girls love watching Frozen and Moana and really just anything princess related. But the biggest thing that the two of them love to do together with my wife and I is sit down and just read books. And, you know, we've read all the classics. We've read The Rainbow Fish and we've read Curious George. And of course, we've read Peanut Goes for the Gold. 
And now that last one may not be a classic, but it is a huge hit in our house and I highly recommend checking it out. But anyway, this year we took a really exciting first step in our literary journey together. My oldest read her first ever chapter book and technically her preschool teacher did the reading, but she listened to her first ever chapter book. And it wasn't just any chapter book. It was a tried and true classic. They read The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. And I'm sure we're all really familiar with the story by this point, but just a little refresher. A young girl named Dorothy from Kansas, who's tired of the same repetitive daily routine, gets swept away by a tornado to the magical land of Oz. There, she meets three companions who all want something that's kind of missing from their life. And so together, they all travel down the road and set off to find the powerful wizard who they believe can help them find what it is that they're looking for and help them achieve their goals. So in the end, they end up realizing that what they wanted isn't really what they needed and that they actually all had what they needed and what they were looking for the whole time. So if I were to ask Molly to just throw up a poll real quick asking the most memorable quote from the Wizard of Oz, I'm willing to bet money that it would be a 50-50 split between Toto, I've got a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. And of course, there's no place like home. So let's just take off our movie buff hats for a moment and put on our presentation thinking caps. And let's look at these two quotes and give them a little bit deeper look. We'll see that beyond just being memorable, they're also stating Dorothy's problem and her solution. I've got a feeling that we're not in Kansas anymore. There's been a catalyst, a disruption to the equilibrium of Dorothy's everyday life. She's no longer in her safe, familiar surroundings of her family's home. Now she's in an unfamiliar and frightening land. Before, her world was all black and white and sepia tone. Now she's in this bright, vibrant, technicolor contrasting world. It's disorienting and alarming to her. And, you know, not to mention the whole her house just killed a person thing. Yikes. But so let's fast forward to the end of the book or the movie. You know, we'll find out that the solution to Dorothy's problem, the thing that she really needed to get back home to Kansas, was literally in front of her all along. She'd been wearing her solution every step of the way of her journey. All she had to do was truly believe that there's no place like home. So now that we have that knowledge, let's take a step back. Let's look at Dorothy's journey through the land of Oz. In the movie, it's a bit different from that of the book, but you know they can only cram so much into an hour and 52 minutes, I suppose. But so in the movie, Dorothy crash lands in Oz. Her house falls into the land of the munchkins. She gets sent off down the yellow brick road where she meets up with her companions. They take a little snooze in a field of poppies and they walk right up to the Emerald City. But from there, the wizard has them perform a task for him, sets the, they set off on that path, they come back, before you know it, she's clicking her heels and she's home in no time. In the book, however, Dorothy and her companions, they traverse canyons, they encounter creatures that are part bear, part tiger. They enlist the service of a thousand mice and their queen. There's territorial conflicts and political divides. There's just so much more all before they finally achieve their goal of reaching the Emerald City. Just to be sent back out by the wizard again to perform a task to return, to receive their gifts, and finally Dorothy gets to click her heels and go home to Kansas. But, you know, we're not here today to do a deep dive and analysis of the literary beats and the story arc of The Wizard of Oz. So how does all of this relate to creating a problem slide? Well, to be a better presenter, we need to be better storytellers and to understand the role in which storytelling plays in our presentations. So in a story, a problem is a central unifying event that everything focuses around. And when and only when that problem is solved, can the story be concluded? Now, in the marketing world, a problem slide should clearly demonstrate an issue in your market industry that no other company is solving. What are the pain points your audience is feeling and why should they care? Why does this matter to them? So if we combine all of that, we end up with an issue in our market, surrounding us like a haunted forest, dark and gloomy and full of uncertainty. And our problem slide is now the central unifying event that we are mapping the rest of our story around. 
Our deck focuses around this. It becomes the yellow brick road running throughout Oz, guiding our audience, our Dorothy, to the solution, the Emerald City, the promised land at the end of the road, at the end of our story. So let's go back. Let's look at Dorothy's journey with this new understanding of problems and problem slides and how they relate to one another. We can see that all of these challenges and obstacles on her journey that she faced, they start to feel similar to all the challenges and obstacles that we as marketers and designers are facing when we're trying to communicate and create our problem slides. Not only that, but there's a, something a little familiar about this layout and design. Now, raise your hand if you've seen a slide like this or even this slide before. And I can't see any of you, but I'm assuming there's a ton of hands in the air right now. In the industry, we have a very technical term for this slide. We call it a spaghetti slide and we see it all the time. And now, while it may look messy and chaotic, that's all by design and for a reason. When you look at the slide, it doesn't look like a happy, successful journey that this customer went on. It looks like they may have had to traverse some canyons and encounter a couple of beasts and maybe enlist the service of a couple of mice to help them. You know, and the design of this slide, the design of any slide should always serve a function. And in this instance, the function of this design is to communicate a complex problem. So let's look at a few examples of problems, of slides that are problematic in the wrong way. One of the biggest issues that we see with problem slides every day is that they just don't look like problems. Now look at these slides. How many of these slides screamed problem at you when I clicked to this? Was it literally just the one that says problem at the top, underlined in bold? Or maybe it was is this one with the bright orange background. I feel like we're getting closer, but we're just not quite there. And honestly, how many of you would have guessed that this one was about detecting forest fires and not just scheduling a nice misty morning hike through the forest with Corey? No matter what the problem or the reason, we can agree that these slides, they just don't communicate problem clear enough. So if we want our slides to avoid falling short in their communication and function, well, we need to make our audience feel the impact of the problem. It needs to punch them right in the gut, make them sweat a little bit. But you know, how can we do that with just one slide? It seems like a nearly impossible task. Well, much like how Dorothy needed the help of her companions on her journey to overcome challenges and obstacles, complete certain tasks, ultimately achieve their final goal of returning home, you're gonna need the help of a few companions on your journey to help make a successful and impactful problem slide. First, we're gonna need design. Are the elements on your slide thoughtfully placed? Are they helping support the message or are they just adding visual noise? We're gonna need clarity. Are you clear in your wording and messaging? And we're gonna to need to focus. Is the problem the only thing that your slide is speaking to? Or are you already jumping ahead and trying to introduce the solution before people even know why they should care? And if you utilize all three of these companions while crafting your problem, the end result is a truly impactful slide. So this is a favorite of ours at Ghost Ranch to use as an example. And while it may feel a bit dramatic and a bit over the top to some of you, there is no denying that this slide immediately felt like a problem. The weight of the situation was evident as soon as I clicked to it. Let's dissect the slide a little bit and just see how those three companions helped us achieve that goal. So first up, let's talk about the design of the slide. If we look beyond the layout and the stylization and the call out of the bright orange circles or the contrasting text and the white on that dark blue background, the design of this slide is really simple and straightforward. There's a dark tsunami crashing in the background. This guy is clearly troubled and deep in thought, probably over the crisis of enterprise readiness, whatever that means. But do you see how without even a single word on the slide, we've already set the tone for disaster. We're communicating visually to our audience that there's a storm on the horizon. There's winged monkeys circling overhead. Dorothy's been locked in the Wicked Witch's tower and we have to save her. We have a problem. So let's look at how we can now be clear in our communication and messaging of that problem. The messaging being used on this slide, it's clear in its intent. The headline is short and concise and it gets right to the point. But also look at the words that are being used. They help convey the dire situation of this message. 
had the headline simply said enterprise readiness, the whole meaning of this slide has changed. We're no longer talking about a problem slide. This is just a general statement. Maybe it's just an industry update. It's unclear. Now, what about this one? It's clear that something is wrong with enterprise readiness, but it still doesn't give the audience that uneasy feeling. Like Dorothy walking out of her farmhouse in Oz for the first time, this is a catalytic moment for your audience. Their equilibrium has been shifted. We want them to feel like they're not in Kansas anymore. They're seeing things in technicolor for the first time. There is a crisis happening, people. Storm clouds are rolling in. These are the feelings that we want your audience to feel when reading through the problem slide. With a clear and impactful message, we can accomplish that with nothing but a type. All right, so we have powerful design, we have clear message, but are we focused in what we're saying? By focusing your messaging on a few key points, you can direct, you can create a direct connection between you, your problem, and the audience. You're showing them why this is a problem and why they need to care about it. If you're trying to make too many points at once at one time on the slide, your audience doesn't feel that connection. There's too much happening. They, yeah, I guess I can kind of relate to that. That's a lot less impactful than a few points that say, oh, shoot, I did not realize that it was that bad. If we want our audience to see themselves in the presentation, they absolutely have to see themselves in the problem slide and to understand that it's their problem. It's a big one. They need to care about it. Without this criteria, there's no catalyst for action. So with our three companions, we have a well-crafted, well-designed slide with clear messaging, and we're focused. And now we've learned these elements to a successful slide, and let's be real. This wasn't some sort of hidden secret. These were things that we all knew deep down inside. So let's take a look at how these three fundamental elements came into play on a couple of slides that we helped take from problematic to impactful. For example, this slide, it fails to explicitly state anywhere that there's even a problem. They're already jumping ahead to their solution and trying to explain how they're solving things that haven't even been identified yet. But if we look at how we solved it here, you can see that with a dramatic color palette, some guiding lines, a few bold Xs to guide your eye throughout and call attention to different areas of the slide, we were able to clearly communicate that there's a problem and there's something wrong with the current state of things. Remember this one earlier, Corey, our misty morning hike through the forest? Well, you never would have guessed that the talk track and the key takeaways from this slide were all around Corey's role in helping detect and prevent forest fires. But with a little bit of drama, the forest fire message is a bit clearer. The problem's feeling a bit more impactful and the audience is starting to take notice and realize that they should be caring. They're invested in this. Now, not all problem slides need to be dark and brooding and doom and gloomy to be impactful. As long as your messaging is clear, your design isn't detracting from what you're trying to say, your audience will feel the impact. They'll feel the weight. They can relate and see themselves in the problem. It'll speak to them. They'll understand what it is that you're trying to communicate and how they should be impacted by it. So don't forget about your three companions. They're here to help you along your journey. And with their help, you'll have a powerfully designed, clear, focused messaging. Your audience will resonate with it. They'll feel the disruption to their equilibrium. They'll understand why it is they should care. And if you attended Molly's Lunch and Learn last month on the seven ba basic plots, you might remember her talking about the most universally accepted story structure created by Aristotle, in which he states that every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And then the German dramatist Freytag uh, expanded upon this idea and stated that within these three acts, there are events of rising and falling action leading up to one big climax point. Only after that point can everything be resolved. So think of your problem slide as the central unifying event of your deck, spanning all three acts, leading your audience to that big climactic point. That's going to be your solution. And if you've used all three of the fundamental elements in building your problem slide to get them there, don't be afraid to be a bit dramatic. The wizard certainly wasn't. And just remember that a little bit of drama can go a long way 
But as long as it follows the rules of design, it's clear and focused in its messaging and intent, bring the drama and help drive your points home to push your audience up that last hill to the climactic point. And remember, the more impactful that your problem is, the more powerful your solution will feel. Your audience will finally feel and believe that there is no place like home. And lucky for you guys, on July 19th, we have a lunch and learn uh, to help with that. It's gonna be hosted by Lindsay Hadley, an amazing associate creative director here at Ghost Ranch. Find your solution slide. Lindsay is the Glinda to my Dorothy, and I am so excited to see what she has to share with you all and the knowledge that she's going to bring to that. Uh, so with that, I will open it up to any questions and answers for a few minutes. Thanks so much, Jeff. That was awesome. Um, and yeah, just to reiterate, um, with this problem slide, Lunch and Learn, we kind of have a Marco Polo's uh, pairing with next month's Lunch and Learn on July 19th. So if you signed up for this, uh, I have your email and we'll definitely be in touch about that one because those are such pertinent slides we see again and again to be able to yeah, better convey the story and just be that much more effective within your decks. So want to open it up to Q&A either in the chat or the Q&A box. And Robin has already plugged one in here that I think is a common pain point, Jeff, which is yeah. that if you have a bunch of facts to share, could you have multiple problem slides grouped thoughtfully? Or is it more of a recommendation? And Robin, you can expand on this, but is it better to have just one slide? Um, sure. And yeah, that's a common thing, I think. What do you say? I guess in that sort of situation, it would depend on your solution. Do you have one unifying solution to all those problems or do they each require their own solution to speak back to them? If you have one unifying solution, then it'd probably be more impactful to, to choose the biggest problem, the one that seems to hit the broadest audience and have the biggest impact or make the biggest points and focus on that one to set the tone. And then throughout your presentation, you kind of sprinkle in the other problems of also, did you know this was also happening? And, you know, bring them closer and closer to that edge of kind of the tipping point of like, oh God, there's so much wrong. We need a solution. And then you swoop in at the end with your big solution to kind of help um, catch them and be the hero of the story. Hopefully that, that helps and makes sense. Yeah. And I'd also add just with like audience centric messaging, if you have the capacity and uh, to, to know which audience you're speaking to, it might be a different problem that really resonates with the audience per, um, per context, right? So if one audience is going to really have a different pain point than another one that your product or service can address, you know, might address multiple, but it might be good to like hone in on one sure you can speak to these other ones but mm -hmm. really kind of cater it for the audience too mm -hmm. to make it that much more powerful per context um Brees is asking how do you design a problem side when you have a lot of data to include like yeah stuffing um numbers and research totally. uh, i guess kind of similar to to robin's look through all of that and find the the data or data i want to say that's most impactful to your story um the one that's going to really get the heart rate raised for your audience the most. There might be a lot of data that feels important, impactful. Look through it and see if some of it's kind of making similar points to others, or if it's even detracting from your overall message, but it's still impactful. You may not want to include it. Um, just really read through, figure out what is the key message that you're trying to say and what data points help support that message in the best way and focus on that. And then again, feel free to sprinkle it in throughout the deck to kind of make a breadcrumb trail along your along the, the path to help kind of carry the audience through and re help them realize that this problem expands beyond what they thought it might. Right, right. Um, and that kind of speaks to, I know Missy said when she logged on that um, one of the biggest problems is that heavy content mm -hmm. or, and um, having that included in architecture slides, getting all yeah. the information in as well. Less um, is more all the time. Right, right. Yeah. And Jeff, what would you say like for, um, you know, in a pitch deck context, mm -hmm. like when is the best place to put the problem slide? Like talking about the placement within it, you know, yeah. after, well, you know, what should come before that leading up to that? Totally. I, I like to put the problem slide towards the beginning, you know, kind of similar to this, set the tone, set the stage, let them know who you are, why you're talking about what you're talking about, why they should even be listening to you. Um, and then immediately kind of throw them off kilter, get them to the edge of their seat right away and just hit them with like, we've got a problem, something's wrong. It grabs their attention. It helps them feel invested before they've had a chance to tune out. Um, you know, you've told them why they should be listening to you. Now tell them what it is you're going to be speaking about and why that matters to them. Mm -hmm. uh, the sooner, the better, I feel. And that gives you the chance to relate and tie back to that problem throughout the deck and kind mm -hmm. of keep hitting them with the repetition. 
um, to really drive home the point. And that way, when you bring in the solution, they've heard it numerous times of why this is a problem, why it's so bad, why it's so impactful. And the solution comes in at the end of this, uh, you know, big Emerald City glistening to, to help save the day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you want the audience to like resonate with the problem, bring them into that world. And uh, ideally, hopefully it's a problem that they're dealing with too. And whether they know it or not, you know, it'd be yeah. like the world could be better, paint them that better world. And so it's really just like setting setting it up for that to be um, that much more impactful. Totally. Yeah. Um, anything, yeah. And um, just to say that, like, we love talking about this. So if you do have like something that's popped into your head during this, or you came to this webinar, with a problem slide that's giving you problems, then we, we'd we love to chat more on it and you can reach out individually and um, you'll have my email with the follow-up, um, the follow-up email as well. Um, Missy is asking, do you have a specific design principle you tend to lean towards to make people like sweat a little during the problem slide? Like you were talking about the drama and yeah. <laughs> kind of uh, tactics for that. Yeah, I, I feel like the more you can make it relatable to someone and avoid, you know, the example side that we're using here isn't always the greatest example for, for my personal preference of making it feel personal and not stock photo-y, you know, people often see the same photos over and over again. And so they might check out feel like, oh, it's just, they found this online somewhere. But if you can really make it feel personal and relate to someone, then they start to think like, oh yeah, this is something that happens to me. This is, I see this all the time when I work and it kind of gets them to sweat a little bit. Um, big, bold text, I feel like often helps with that nice contrast too, to really kind of set things apart and give them that uneasy feeling. Um, if everything's just too nice and beautiful and happy, kind of like this nice, beautiful pink background, the slide currently, no <laughs> one's feeling worried and nervous and anxious during this part, um, other than probably myself, because I'm talking to a bunch of people. But if you have kind of this uneasy feeling this contrast between something really dark and something really bright and vibrant it automatically sets people to this feeling of like oh yeah something's something's not right here i i'm on edge i'm uneasy and um i feel like that helps the most yeah definitely and we always want to give you know we work with a lot of designers but the ghost ranch clients are often product marketers who don't mm -hmm. have a design team or as much time for design. So high contrast and those big, bold things are really accessible pieces of design. Mm -hmm. We always want to give some accessible um, options to include. It doesn't have to be the most complex design ever. It can just be big old text, uh, really kind of scary wave stock photo, you know, so yeah. like showed earlier. So we want to make sure that like people can uh, implement those ideas into their decks. Um, and I like this with Bree, uh, Brees is asking, have you seen any particular patterns with problems and solution slides? Um, I suppose me, maybe meaning patterns like things that come up with problems with them and patterns that of what makes them look um, more effective and look uh, really good together. Yeah, I would say having them feel cohesive and connected without being the same. Um, I didn't talk about it with problem slides. You don't ever want to introduce your branding on a problem slide. You don't want people to immediately be associating your brand colors with the issue, with what's wrong and the problem. But if you can find kind of compliments to your brand colors, the opposite end, that way they're already kind of in the mindset of, you know, red's bad and then green comes in as the hero yeah. and that's your brand colors or whatever. It creates this kind of nice balance with one another. Um, if you use black and white photography in the problem slide, using color photography for the solution, brings you into that technicolor world where everything's new and exciting. Um, and just kind of having patterns that play off of one another and feel connected without being a repetition of, oh yeah, we've already seen this slide before, here it is again. Um, yeah, I think that usually is kind of the most successful way that I've seen. Yeah, and I love that. Um, I know Lindsay will speak to more of that with the psychology of color um, mm -hmm. with some solution slides because there's those subconscious uh, small choices you can make that really, yeah, not associating your brand with the problem, but associating with the solution and keeping it part of the same story. Um, mm -hmm. It can be just a really subtle thing, but make sure it's included, you know, uh, make it that much more impactful. All right, I think we've got time for maybe one more. Jeff, if you want to share any parting, parting thoughts, <laughs> let's see. Uh, let me just check this. Otherwise, um, yeah, July 19th, Wednesday at the same time, 12 p.m. Eastern, we'll be going through solution slides and you'll be receiving this recording by the end of the week. So thanks for joining everyone. Really, um, really appreciate your time. Thanks, Robin. Yeah.
(laughs) This has been the Storyteller Study Club. (laughs) And we will, yeah, we'll see you next time. One last shameless plug. Play us out with some more (laughs) Jay-Z. Perfect. All right. Thanks, everyone. Keep on pitching.